My name is Bill Hamilton. I'm the executive director at the University of Florida College of Law eDiscovery Project. I'm also a legal skills professor here at the University of Florida. And I'd like to welcome all those here on campus and the online audience to our fall 2018 eDiscovery Distinguished Speaker event. Today we have with us John Tredenick. John Tredenick is the founder and now chairman of the board of Catalyst Secure, which is one of the nation's preeminent e-discovery software programs. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have John with us. Uh, John and I go way back. We met some 20 years ago on an American Bar Association Committee in Charge of Technology for the ABA, and we worked together on that committee. Right away, I was impressed with John. He's written many books on litigation. As you all, those of you who know me know I was a litigator for 30 years. Uh, uh, John Tredenick was a litigator for 20 years, but then his career took a slightly different direction. He then, uh, coming out of Holland and Hart, where he was that uh, senior partner, he then developed uh, an e-discovery software firm, Catalyst Secure, took that from ground zero uh, to the massive operation it is today. He has widely published, received many, many awards for technology, innovation, and development. I'm not going to go through all of them, but take it from me, this man is a superstar in the e-discovery world and the world of artificial intelligence. I will say one thing about uh, uh, John. He uh, was pioneering in an important shift in e-discovery over the past four years, and that's a shift in technology-assisted review from uh, a process using seed sets to what we now call continuous active learning. It revolutionized e-discovery practice. It started with this man, John Tredenick, and I'd like you to all give him a great Gator welcome. John. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And thanks to everybody. Is this mic on? Good. I can't tell you how excited I am to be out here today not only with my good friend Bill Hamilton, and we do go way back to when technology was more an idea than a reality, but also to be talking about what I think is maybe one of the, or if not the most important subjects, and most important for young lawyers, not just for the old lawyers. I'm not sure there's ever been a time in the legal history where there wasn't more opportunity for young lawyers to make changes, to do things to promote justice for all. There are so many opportunities, and we're going to talk about many of them as we watch how this world changes. But welcome to computing of the 1950s, when people first thought about AI and began to think about systems. And they thought, shoot, by the 60s, computers will rule mankind. It didn't quite work that way, but I'm not so sure that uh, that we aren't in that period today. Um, welcome to the fourth industrial revolution. Think about it a little bit. The steam engine created the first industrial revolution in the 18th century and mechanized things, uh, that, uh, including the steam engine, which connected us and made things possible. And then the second revolution in the 19th to the 20th was electricity. As lights went on and those steam factories went away now powered by central engines. We live in the third revolution, which uh, Bill and I grew up in, when computing power came on the scene but became ubiquitous. I mean, there's more computing power in this room just in your smartphones than, than they had uh, shooting a rocket to the moon or the Pentagon had during the last few wars. Um, but maybe many don't realize that we are now entering a fourth revolution and this one's built around the amazing tools people are coming up with. Our focus today is artificial intelligence, but there's more to it. There's robotics, there's genetic uh, uh, manipulations, and just changes everywhere in our life. So there couldn't be a more exciting time to apply your legal skills, because change is where the law comes first. Change is where people have to step in and, and work through the frictions and the rights. But AI is a big thing now. We've gotten a little behind with China and some of the other countries, but great universities like MIT are now investing in whole colleges built on AI. And I couldn't be more excited. So artificial intelligence is our theme. And my first question today is, how many of you have heard of Ava? 
Nobody. Well, let's do this for a moment. While you're eating lunch, I'd like you to listen to a little music. This is the Luxembourg Philharmonic, and I, I just like this piece, so I thought, I thought uh, you might enjoy it while you're uh, eating your sandwiches. In 2016, a young fella in Luxembourg set out to create an AI engine that could compose classical music. He spent thousands of hours of the best classical music in our history into this algorithm and then set it loose to make music. We're listening to a Luxembourg symphony on technology today, and this was written entirely by an algorithm. Imagine that. Think about the things people have tried to do with computers in the past to mimic the human gifts that we all have. Melody, volume, and connectedness. You can write out all the sheet music. You can do movie scores, TV shows. The possibilities are all endless. By the way, they thought about doing this with country music. And they fed it all in. And the problem was, it only came out with one song, the same chords, and it was just trucks or dogs or lost girlfriends. <laughs> Disruption. Think about this. This is all one young kid, Pierre Barreau, probably your age. When I tell you this is a great time to go into the legal profession, the disruptors are not coming from us gray hairs. Notice, they're coming from young people. Young people who aren't limited in our imaginations that realize that the world is changing and they can disrupt. And of course, not everybody is excited about this as I am. When uh, the Luxembourg Philharmonic played this, it was commissioned by the Government for Technology Day, the old line composers, the buggy whip makers, the slide rule, they did not think too much of this. They called it an affront to Luxembourg's composers, a slap in the face of all creative people in the arts. Think about that too, because AI is a two-edged sword and it's kind of interesting. So what the heck is this artificial intelligence? That's real intelligence there. Artificial intelligence is more like me trying to tell you what artificial intelligence is, but it is the ability of the computer to mimic certain operations of the human mind, and there are many definitions. Uh, it's the term we use when machines are able to learn, reason, and discover meaning or generalize from large volumes of data. It is built with a goal of arriving at a reasoned conclusion, simulating the human decision process, and most important, often with better decisions. That's our field today. It's a fascinating field. I just wanted to put up the first robot, the first AI intelligent robot. That was from 1818, Mary Shelley uh, and Frankenstein. She didn't actually get it built, but she thought about it. Um, but the field uh, artificial intelligence was born at Dartmouth College by uh, several uh, MIT scientists, uh, Carnegie Mellon scientists, people from IBM and they began talking about this field in the late 50s. One of the first goals, of course, was to design systems that could mimic humans. And the first systems out there, one of them was a, a system to play checkers against humans. And within a few years, they had that system playing checkers as well as humans. Now, checkers isn't that big deal. I call it the dancing bear phenomenon. Everybody know the dancing bear phenomenon? It's not how well the bear dances, it's that it can dance at all. <laughs> and in the early stages of AI, that's what we were about. Um, in the 60s, the Defense Department got into this and threw a lot of funding into it. 
there were so many promises of what you could do with AI, but they never came to fruition. And so we have what we call the AI winter in the uh, 70s and 80s uh, that was followed up by the rise of expert systems in the 80s and into the 90s. Why was there a winter? Because we didn't have the computing power, let alone the know-how, to really achieve the kind of dreams people had with AI. And uh, in the first level of AI, with the development of expert systems, probably you've all dealt with expert systems, I can remember back in the late 80s, early 90s, going to ABA meetings, with people like Bill Hamilton, where a friend from Memphis, Wynn Smith, brilliant lawyer, had designed a billing system where it would ask you questions and you type in answers. Questions like, well, did you achieve a better than expected result? Um, did you use your budget above or below? And ultimately, you would say, well, I think you should bump your bill up by 20% uh, for success fee or what have you. Now, the systems were designed in a linear fashion. In other words, I could tree out all the possible questions. I could tree answers. I could send you in other directions. And it was exciting, but it never caught on, um, at least in terms of this billing system, because none of us ever figured out a way to premium bill anything. Um, but he would cart that computer and a big printer just to show us, and it was so exciting. Um, expert systems have gone a long way, as we'll talk about it. But there was sort of, again, a lull till the end of the century, when, as you guys know, the computing power, Moore's law, if you will, the capabilities just exploded to where we could do so much more. So we call it an AI resurgence. And uh, this is kind of fun, because once they got checkers down, of course, the goal was to come up with a, a, a an AI algorithm that could play chess as well as a human. And um, uh, Friedkin, uh, one of the scientists that really started AI, offered a reward for anybody who could develop a chess system an algorithm that could beat the best. And so people worked on it for 17 years. There was something called chip test, which evolved into deep thought. Gary Kasparov is considered the best chess player in history by many. And so he was asked to play Deep Thought, and he beat it handily. No big deal. So they kept working, and in 1996, Deep Blue came around. You all heard of Deep Blue? It's old history. But it was IBM's uh, attempt to develop a top-quality chess player. Um, and it was very exciting to us in the 90s that weren't in our diapers. But um, the first try, Kasparov defeated Deep Blue, although he did lose a match the first time. But the prize was to win the two out of three match. So IBM went back and put more power into it. And in 1997, it upgraded the computing power. Some call it Deeper Blue. And uh, Deeper Blue won. Won the match. Kasparov won the first. And, and much of the nation was glued to their TV sets and radios watching this match. It was very famous in the day. Kasparov won the first match. Deep Blue won the second. There were like five draws, and then Kasparov made a mistake, and Deep Blue beat him, and that was two out of three. Now, he demanded a, a replay immediately, and IBM said no. I think they realized their marketing was right as good as it's ever going to get, and we're going to move on. But that was kind of the start. And then everybody knows about Watson. IBM's is the greatest marketing move, Watson Jeopardy, and uh, Watson won uh, pretty handily, and, and, and on the last question, uh, the money was so uh, out of whack that uh, the humans knew they couldn't win regardless. But uh, the question for that one's kind of fun. You would have gotten this quickly. William Wilkinson's An Account of the Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia inspired this author's most famous novel. How many would have gotten that as quick as, uh, yeah, right. And you know what the novel was? We'll at least try that. Do you know what the novel was? Dracula, exactly. Um, AlphaGo is, is a much more recent uh, step for AI, also exciting. It's a simple enough game. It was invented thousands of years ago. And the goal, I, I won't pretend to play it, but the goal is to not have your stone surrounded by the other color. And the problem here is this. In chess, there are a massive number of moves possible. And the approach to AI at the time was to use the computing power 
at each stage to figure out all the possibilities and then ultimately weigh the least worse or the best of the options, uh, thinking ahead a few levels. But computing power was limited. For Go, they thought it would never, they'd never come up with uh, sufficient horsepower to beat a human at Go because there are, at least by some people's reports, 10 to the 170 possible positions. That's more positions than there may be atoms in the universe. So they had to come up with a whole new approach, and that's really the key to the evolution of AI. Rather than humans try to figure this out and, and plot it out and deal with the trees, they let the computer go wild, and it just studied and played itself many thousands of times, watching to see which moves work better and which didn't. And that's uh, a key to the new kind of AI. We're not programming it, it's figuring it out on its own, much like uh, Ava seems to have done. And so just beat the human handily five games in a row. And ultimately the lesson here at least is that when the goals are clear and the rules are simple enough, you're going down. Every one of us are going down. The computer's going to beat us every time. And we need to think about that. This is a good story about a new approach to AI. We've all used Google Translate, right? Put it in, it translates, it does pretty well, better in some languages than others. So the history of translation was kind of the AI 1.0 versus 2.0. They quite naturally put together language experts in the early days, and they said, well, you know French, you know English, we, if we can just program in all the rules and the dictionaries, we can come up with a translation system. Well, it was a terrible failure. I, I had guys come by uh, in the early days of Catalyst that were trying to build a form of fuzzy search or AI search where you put words in and it would analyze the synonyms. And of course, there are many synonyms for words. Some apply, some don't. But they were going to go through and set up the rules and they had a bunch of money. They'd been going six years and they had gotten to the letter L. And I thought, you know, if we had e-discovery and, and they wouldn't mind limiting our searches up to L, I'd have something there that was big. Well, they never made it. And uh, Google came along with an AI algorithm, an engine. And what they did was fed it all the UN documentation. Because the UN requires that everything it puts out be translated in like 30 languages. I'm not sure if everything is, but an awful lot is in 30 languages. So they showed all these to the algorithm and let it figure ways to translate. And they never wrote any rules, to my knowledge, or, or not the kind they were trying to do. And yet, the engine figures it out. It learns. And we're going to talk a little bit about machine learning and, and what we do with predictive analytics, and it's very much the same. You're not telling it how to do its job. And that's so amazing and so powerful for the future. So there are different types of uh, AI. And, and one thing we don't want to do is get confused between the uses of AI and the types of AI. Robotics is a use of AI, but it may use several types of AI. Uh, I'm not going to pretend to explain all these types of AI, but machine learning is uh, what we're going to talk about a bunch. Fuzzy logic is a world where things are not digital. In most of computing, it's a one or a zero, it's a yes or a no, but what if it's sort of a yes and sort of a no? And so they're building algorithms to kind of weigh things out and that's very powerful. Symbolic reasoning, uh, a simple uh, uh, all men uh, have dark hair to make one up. Joe is a man, ergo Joe has dark hair. Uh, symbolic reasoning is very important in a, in a branch of AI. The genetic algorithms I won't even begin to explain, but these are algorithms that go through different possibilities and then weigh the results, trying to find the best possibilities and they move forward. Um, but it's very exciting and it's become big in the legal profession. There are so many companies out there now, and we'll talk about a few of these, I, I won't begin to tell you all about it, but there's so many companies that are developing systems that are using AI techniques and people want to debate is it really AI, is it not? It doesn't matter. They're using these techniques to improve the practice of law. And that is what matters. However it gets done, we don't much care. 
I'm going to show you how it gets done in one case. But, um, but it's so exciting, and these are going to affect your practices. I was kidding with Bill. When we got out of law school, we had no thought that things were going to change in any material way through our careers. And it was very different than doctors. So when a doctor graduated, the doctor starts ordering journals, research journals. And he or she knows that the rest of their career, they're going to be reading this stuff and continuing to learn. When we graduated, boom, closed the books, we thought we were done. And that we were just rake in the money and do our cases or trials, but we didn't have to learn anything. Well, that's changed. And today, there's so much you're going to have to learn. And I'll tell you, it's a lot more fun. And the future is a lot more interesting than it was in my world. My old world was kind of like the dentist's office. I haven't seen many changes there. And 20 years, same steel grills and same light with a tin foil on it or the saran wrap. Um, just they wear masks now for some reason. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the kind of ways people are using AI techniques that impact the law. Here's a list. We'll walk through a few of them. But legal research is front and center uh, and very important to you at this stage in your career. I remember being excited about Westlaw when they came out with something called WIN. Anybody heard of WIN? Or is that totally dated? That meant Westlaw is natural. And the difference was you could just type in things like a question rather than coming up with the Boolean constructs of uh, uh, damages within six, of sanction within 12 of this, that, and the other. Um, and to be fair, many of us prided ourselves on our Boolean skills who is the best at crafting these searches. But I, I just wanted to write and say, uh, when are sanctions appropriate for a failure to disclose witnesses or something? And the natural language processing in Westlaw would do an amazing job of finding cases. And I think you know, I knew that I didn't need a search to find all the cases. I just needed it to find a couple that were on point because the cross-referencing that we do as lawyers makes it very easy. Once we hit the mother load, I used to call it. I haven't done research in a long time, but I'm sure it's much the same. So um, that was a form of AI as far as I'm concerned. But you have organizations now, and there's a lot of money developing true AI systems, systems that work more like uh, our Insight Predict Technology Assisted Review Engine. And we'll talk about that. But there the goal is, as, uh, as you find documents that you like, the algorithm watches and finds more that you like. And here, as you begin to search and find cases, the algorithm, not a Boolean search, but the algorithm is pulling back other cases from potentially other districts or the, your district or topic areas, whatever, that uh, might be of interest to you. And this is very exciting. It's a method to cut down research time. It's a method to bring more quality. All of AI, if it works, reduces time, reduces cost, but doesn't reduce quality. If anything, it improves quality. And that's the magic. It, in theory, you say the old rule was you can have any two out of these three, but not the third. And um, now you can have all three. So Ross is a system that draws off Watson, our friend Watson, to provide research. Now, they're, they're a couple years out now, but they've their problem, of course, is they have to get the data and load it in. And they're, you know, our legal profession, we granted a monopoly to the West and Lexuses of the world. It was a time when, uh, at least in the court systems in Colorado, I was clerking on the Supreme Court, uh, those opinions go straight to West. And then they get to distribute it and charge for it. And somebody said, well, that's kind of a monopoly. And there's been a change. And now that things are open. But still, for any AI, even our system, you've got to get the data. But once you have it and you can let the algorithm loose, you can do amazing things. And here the goal, of course, is to be able to ask it natural language questions or to give it documents um, like a complaint and have it just go find the cases that might relate to it and the law that might inform the complaint. This is um, Quasi-Expert Systems Group, another old friend, uh, Mark Lordson, da David Mills and others, Neotologic, where they wanted to build expert systems, and they did, and they've been doing it. 
um, for many years. And what I don't know today is how much AI they've injected in it. Because in the past, it was literally writing if, uh, if uh, you know, my earnings are over 100000 the alternative minimum tax now applies, and I've got to fill out that kind of thing. And you can do that, and you can do amazing things, but you can't do everything. You can't do translations. So this is an interesting period of transition for them where they try to find new approaches and algorithms that can help make these expert systems even smarter, and there are lots of them. Very specialized law firms that have developed systems to uh, help you deal with sanctions, regulations, uh, or IP and the like. But this is a good one, Neotologic, dealing in expert automation. LegalZoom. I remember in the early days when we almost made fun of those folks. Uh, we had good friends that started a different system. LegalZoom came in with a lot of money, and they claim they've got six million clients now. Uh, I think even Bill's old firm didn't have six million clients, did it, Bill? It's probably five, but not six million. Um, I don't know how this works underneath the surface. I would bet you money they have AI engineers working away if they didn't before. Uh, but they're plotting ways to do a will. And for most people, they can't afford to go to a lawyer for a traditional will, which might cost $3,000. But I can log in and do a will that meets the requirements of every state because they can figure that out and do it for, I haven't tried, but what, $20 or $30? You can form a corporation. But they're not stopping there. They have increased the number of kinds of tool, uh, algorithms and expert systems they can offer, and they won't stop. And there have been the battles in the state courts. Texas was one that uh, alleged that not this group, but NOLO. NOLO Press was one of the earlier starts at this out of Berkeley. And they alleged that this was the unauthorized practice of law and fought them and fought hard. And it was the trade guild speaking, to be candid. Uh, spoke in terms of protecting the public, but uh, we were protecting our jobs. And that never holds up, even though we'll always try it. Uh, and you saw that with the composers uh, who were not happy at all that the uh, Luxembourg government chose to feature a, a computer composer, which, by the way, is the first uh, to have ASCAP recognition as a, an author of music, Ava itself. But you've got LegalZoom, which is uh, changing the, let's say, the lower end of law practice. And we've all got to come to grips with that. And we all have to redefine ourselves in terms of what value we provide. When Walmart came into so many communities, all the hardware stores just went out of business because uh, Walmart could offer everything at a lower price and it was all there. There's a resurgence, of course, because not everybody quit. And now these hardware stores are coming back. They're offering some different products. They're offering people who really can provide service. Because when you go in, it's not to buy a hammer or a drill. It is to build something or put a hole in something. And it's the techniques that are as important. So as lawyers, we have to come to grips with these forces because they're powerful and they are not going away and have to redefine ourselves to the true value. Many, uh, the glass half full, would say that this is just an opportunity to do the things you really went to law school for. Um, how many of you went to law school with the hope of doing document review eight hours a day for the rest of your career, marking things as responsive or not responsive? Well, none of us did that. Uh, I'm guessing that many of you, like me, went because you had a desire to help people who were in a jam or being uh, beat upon by somebody stronger, more well-financed, and you wanted to help them. That's why I went. And, and so these things just provide the underpinning to do just that. It's that opportunity if you take it and don't run from it. But LegalZoom's a big one. Then they move into legal analytics. And this is a huge thing in the corporate world. You will be affected by it, even if you're not the person using it. There's a, a new trend called legal operations, corporate legal operations, that is changing the face of your client base, at least those of you who are going to work with corporations. These are non-lawyers often, professional successful business people who the executives have brought in to, in effect, take over the legal departments who had always been run by lawyers who've been out in private practice and then they move over and they run the legal department 
just the way they would a law firm, use the same services, don't challenge their friends uh, when they say that'll cost you $2 million uh, to litigate this properly, etc. cetera. Uh, the legal operations people have come in and said, uh, litigation is part of our business, we're gonna run this like a business, and their thinking changes what we offer. So the heart and soul of legal operations is legal analytics, reporting, data. You can't improve what you can't measure. And so software is coming in at a rapid pace that gives them information, and it's information about their case, how it's doing against budget, who's being called of the custodians, but equally important, which lawyers are giving me the best value for my money? What's the average billing rate from this firm versus another? And uh, how do my costs compare for summary judgment briefs or depositions and what have you? So you have a number of companies, Lex Machina. Uh, I like it because the CEO played harmonica in my band when we played at Legal Tech, a Grateful Dead kind of band, uh, and I'm still the drummer. But um, uh, they got bought by Lexus, so the big companies are starting to buy these up which is always a great opportunity for the little companies because when the big fish swallow the little fish, I don't know, they get pooped out the back end or something. Nothing good happens when they get bought. Uh, usually the companies fall apart. But, um, but maybe not for Lex Machina, but there are, there are a dozen else out there doing legal analytics. Bright Flag is an interesting one, and I just put this up for the mantra. Bright Flag is a tool for legal departments combining e-billing, matter management, invoice review, and pricing analytics together in one platform. Platforms underpin with new AI language analysis technologies that read and categorize, categorize lawyer time entries, allowing powerful automated invoice review and pricing analytics that drive real savings. They should just have a guy with his finger pointing at you, because that's who they're aiming at, and me. The lawyers, they're gonna figure out when you're billing for that time, you're going to the bathroom, or driving in, or what have you, those meetings where you talk about, no, they, they can't quite figure that out, but they really are pitting us against each other in terms of delivering value. And I'm not saying all the AI is good, or good news for us as an industry, but it is real. And these legal operations people are going after this uh, hook, line, and sinker, and it's affecting things. And the smart lawyers who know how to work the system, if you will, but deliver the real value and deliver it in ways that the analytics engines prefer will be more successful by far than the ones who don't or don't bother. It's another of many examples of legal analytics engines. This is a fun one because uh, this is an old friend, Daniel Katz, a professor up in Chicago. And uh, like many professors, he studies the Supreme Court. And uh, there's always been uh, a large flock of people interested in the court, but mostly interested in predicting how the court will come out on the controversial decisions that make up a good part of their business. So Daniel Katz, uh, working with a team, developed an algorithm that analyzed all the judges' decisions and could then predict how they'd come out. And he's got a very good track record. And the key here is, is what we call big data. Now, for the purist, I wouldn't say that Supreme Court or uh, circuit opinions or district judge opinions rise to big data. Big data is about billions and billions. That's how Google Translate works. But if you can take every judge and analyze every decision that he or she has made throughout their career, every published one to be sure, um, now the engine's got something to work against as it looks at the, the case that's before the court. How the heck it works, I don't know. I'll show you how ours works in a minute. But, but the magic is it does work. I do not know how Ava created that beautiful symphony or the part we listen to, but it does. And that's what's important here for us as lawyers. So there, there are many, this is a fun one. Anybody heard of Do Not Pay? It's really a cell phone application uh, written by a kid uh, in Stanford who, as he said, used to get a lot of parking tickets. And it made him mad. And one answer, of course, the rational answer is, well, don't park in places you're not supposed to park. But he developed an algorithm that would help people who were victimized, because he realized that this is as much a revenue generator as it is a, 
a, a public safety matter. And he developed a system, so far as I know, only works on your phone, um, to help people challenge parking tickets. And he started with that. It was free. Uh, and it became so popular that he began broadening out. Um, so a thousand new bots to help with your legal problems that do not pay. I couldn't begin to tell you what they are or how successful they'll be. But it, it shows you another part of this revolution, which is when they get something working, then there's going to be a thousand things working. Um, when you talk about these trends, uh, always the, the curve is flat as they're figuring things out, and then it rockets up. It rockets up, and that's what we're seeing. We're at that inflection point. That's why I say it may be scary to go out and practice today, but, but man, how exciting. How exciting it's going to be. And they'll always need good, smart humans. But this is a fun one. Broder feels like he saved $9.3 million in parking tickets, 375,000 of them, on a cell phone, no less. And it works in different parts of the world as well. Uh, probably an expert system, not the highest level AI. But I don't really know. It's just fun, and it's all part of it. IP protection, trademark searches could easily take 20 or 30 hours by human beings. And this system using AI, and I guess a big bank of all the information, reduces it to something like seven minutes. Seven minutes. And you have to think about that as an industry as well. Um, it's not good today to be a taxi driver in an age of Uber and Lyft. It's kind of a bummer to be a travel agent in an era of Expedia. And there's some of that that's going to affect the legal profession as well. Some estimate that. 15 to 25 percent of our work could pretty easily be automated. It's the routine work. Uh, what you guys don't remember is the big skill we had to learn uh, in law school was how to work shepherds. And you had a case, and you went over to this stack of books, Shepherd Citator. And what they did is they put a major book out. Some of us here will remember this. Uh, that might cover the last 40 years. And then the second book would cover a year. The third book would cover six months. I'm working on memory here. Forgive me. But you know. And then the next book would be one month, and then maybe weekly and daily. Because if you were shepherdizing a case, you couldn't walk in with a partner and have some case that was overruled last week or whenever the books went. But that meant if you were doing this work at the wrong time of the year before they caught up with the books, you'd be going through six or eight books for each citation. Think about the mind-numbing work we're talking about there. That was just flashed away with Lexus and Westlaw. When I started school, Lexus was just out, and they'd done the state of Ohio and the Ohio courts. And I thought it was exciting, but I didn't plan to practice in Ohio, so I wasn't quite sure how it was going to change my life. But you know, that's how it starts. And then Westlaw came along. But um, now they're doing that kind of thing. Uh, contract review automation is perhaps the biggest part of this business. Um, two fronts. One is due diligence. And I've seen some of this. We don't do that work. But when a corporation's merging, and these mergers are big, the lawyers need to know every contractual obligation that company has. Just to make it simple, one of them is assignment. So I'm acquiring a company that has thousands of contracts, and each has a no assignment clause without uh, written consent of the other side. Well, you better know about that when you buy the company because that is an assignment. And suddenly, you might have to have teams of lawyers going around seeking consent. And it might not be given. So how do you figure out with these contracts? And they're all written in different ways, in different formats. How many of those are out there? Well, the answer is you use these legal analytics for contract review. And many millions of dollars are going into these companies, uh, like Law Geeks and others, who are offering contract due diligence review. A uh, good friend of mine, Kingsley Martin, has a wonderful company doing this. But he's been working on it for a good 10 years. And I remember when he started, I thought, well, how much, wh what opportunity is there? But I just didn't realize how many of these companies suffer from these problems and pay lawyers to solve it. Um, there are really two kinds. Um, this is more of a analyzing the existing contracts. Law Geeks is like 
we'll help you write the contracts and we'll help you uh, write the clauses. And so there's just two sides. That's Kira, not a leading system that's raised a lot of money, but two sides of a system that perform these valuable services that used to be performed by lawyers painstakingly. I remember going back to the early days when my business uh, partners, I was an associate then, uh, one point of pride as a business partner was you were secretary of the company and you kept the books for the company and they'd have rooms with the company books and boy, you got paid a lot because you were the company secretary and you were the keeper and, and my gosh, they're not making money doing that. So, um, many types of artificial intelligence, not a chance will I have time to hit all of them, but I want to focus on one. Uh, I want to move from, from the abstract or the exciting down to uh, real in the trenches work, and that's a focus on machine learning. We do machine learning uh, through predicted catalysts, and I'll show you how we do it. So, um, machine learning is an interaction between a human and a computer uh, in general, or the computer's analyzing documents. Actually, I said that wrong. Uh, unsupervised machine learning is without the interaction of human and computer. It's taking a mass of, let's say, documents and analyzing which ones are similar, which are not, grouping them together in clusters. You heard of clustering? as is. It was a uh, 2000 kind of AI tool. It would group things together on topics, and if, if your $2 million, document, two million document population had uh, a lot of ye a Yahoo uh, newsletters, breaking news kind of stuff, which uh, the collections are full of, it could identify that these really are all the same, and sort of with a click of the button, you could dismiss Yahoo breaking news as not worthy of looking at in your review. But it had lots of problems with everything else because it could group things, but it didn't know anything about your case. So uh, we moved, and others in the 2010s through now, to what's called supervised machine learning. And the magic difference is this. I sit down with, my com with a computer algorithm, and I tell it that this document is the kind I'm looking for, and this one I'm not looking for. And so it becomes an interaction. The computer does, didn't know anything about your case when it was clustering, but as you begin to tell it about your case, the computer can then rearrange or bring to the forefront the documents from those clusters that might be important to you. So supervised machine learning is the big breakthrough. And of course, um, when we started presenting this to the lawyers, the lawyers said, well, how can that help me in litigation? This is really complicated stuff we're doing. I can't imagine a computer could replace me or, or even help me. And so you laugh and you say, uh, yeah, well, it is pretty complicated. And, so are self-driving cars, and yet they're out there today. And while they've had a couple accidents, many caused by the humans, um, their track record is so much better than humans for the many millions of miles they've driven. So we say, yeah, yeah, litigation is complicated. Uh, document search and review is complicated, but AI can help. AI can help. So we call that form of AI, it's supervised machine learning, technology-assisted review. It has many names predictive coding, computer-assisted review. Uh, we always called it predictive ranking because it's a ranking function. So we're going to drill in and show you how that works and, uh, and, and close out for the day. But what is TAR, technology-assisted review? It's fairly simple if you think about it. Number one, it's a process through which humans work with a computer to teach it what you're looking for, to teach it to identify relevant documents. You already know that means it's a variant, it's a supervised machine learning, not the unsupervised. Um, two, and there's only three things. It is letting the computer order the documents by likelihood of relevance for your review. In the old days, and people are still doing it, you might review in date order or Bates number order or custodian, but that doesn't tell you anything about relevance. And what we're letting is the AI algorithm put the relevant ones to the front. You'll see why that's so important. <clears throat> and actually, it's because of this third option, which is not required, but it is an option, which says, hey, if we do this, we can stop the review when we've seen enough of the relevant documents. We don't have to go through all of them. And this is the big thing. This is where we save time, 
and we save money. And I'll show you how that all works. And the fun thing is, when I'm talking to lawyers, you know, they're naturally skeptical, especially the older lawyers. Oh, I don't know about this. There's no precedent. And I always say, oh, absolutely there's precedent. In fact, we found precedent for tar back in medieval England, you know, in the courts of equity and chancery. In those days when there was a dispute, um, and, and they couldn't resolve it any other way, they brought out the tar and the feathers. And they worked on until they drove them out of town. So tar has a lot of history, but we use it every day. Who's using Pandora? I use Spotify now. Um, that's AI. And if you think about Pandora, you know everything you need to know about tar. It's got tens of millions of songs. <coughs> and it only goes to play the music you want to hear. Well, how does it do that? It, it knows how the songs are similar, but knows nothing about what you like. So it doesn't just dish out music at random. It lets you put in an artist, like I like Jimmy Buffett. Um, and I tell it I like Jimmy Buffett, and so Pandora obligingly plays a Jimmy Buffett song, uh, and that makes me happy. Well, the next song might be Zach Brown. Who knows Zach Brown in this audience? Well, everybody does. He's kind of Jimmy Buffett's long lost son. Um, very similar out of Nashville. And I like Zach Brown. So it plays the Zach Brown tune, and I click a big thumbs up. Yep, I like that. Well, the next song that comes out might be Toby Keith. You've probably heard of Toby Keith. Country star, did a few duets with Jimmy. Uh, but I go, ah, oh, now that's too country. Thumbs down, too country. Well, what have I done now? I have started teaching an algorithm about my preferences. And it's the algorithm's job to analyze the attributes of these songs. I won't pretend to tell you how Spotify or Pandora does it, but country, male singer, rock and roll beat, um, whatever. It doesn't have horns in it. Um, but they play music, and it's good, and we like it, and that's why these things are billion-dollar uh, companies today. Well, we're doing the same thing with documents. So you've got two million documents. We can analyze the documents, and show that some look similar to these and some we can cluster them, but we don't know about your case. So here's how it works. It's as simple as Pandora. One, you've got to collect and process your files. That's for sure. If you don't have the data, you can't do anything with it. So what the heck does that mean? Well, we think about paper, running it through a shredder, but what it's really doing is analyzing the words in the document and giving them values. And I won't pretend to tell you how the algorithms work, and they're different ones, but maybe how common the word is in this document, how common it is among the population, but it's analyzing these things. So we start with training. It could be as simple as just pick one relevant document or 50 that you produced earlier. It doesn't matter. You can create a synthetic document just like Jimmy Buffett and you give it to the system and it begins immediately analyzing and ranking. And then it presents the documents to you in the order of likely relevance. Not date, not Bates number, likely relevant. So it ranks. Now how does it do that? Uh, there are a variety of algorithms. Who uh, here could explain maybe how a ge geospatial predictive modeling works? Anybody? Tune? I'm in the law class, aren't I? Not the AI class. Well, here's the deal. There are lots of algorithms, and we don't care how they work. Judge Peck, who wrote the first decision approving the use of TAR in 12, 2012, he confessed. He says, I don't really care how this stuff works as long as you can show me that it does work. And that we can do, even though I've tried to look at the complex matrix algebra that's involved, and it just blows by me every second. So anybody remember the Sneetch machine, uh, Dr. Zeus's star-bellied Sneetch machine? Think of tar like the Sneetch machine. The Sneetches line up. They pay their money. They go in this machine. We don't know what the heck's going on in there. But when they come out, if they got stars on their belly, the process works. It's as easy as that. And we just apply the same principles to TAR. So what does it really do? It builds a complex search, only it can analyze tens of thousands of words, each with individual rankings. And these are the words associated with the documents we're looking for. These are the ones associated with the bad documents. And it just uh, goes back and forth in a process. We test. We stop when we're finished. But it's what we call continuous active learning. And it really revolutionized the TAR industry. Very, very powerful. So how do you know the savings? Well, just quickly, it's the only graph you have to know, is we plot on a graph. And these are the percent of the documents. It could be 2 million. This is the percent of relevant ones we find. In a linear review, it's random. I look at half the documents. I find 50% of the relevant ones, 60-60, 10-10. Uh, 
But in a predictive review, if it's doing its job, it's feeding all the relevant documents first. And what you find out is you review 12% of the population and you found 80% of the relevant documents. You review 24% you found 90%. And the key is the courts say that's enough. Your duty in discovery is to make reasonable efforts. It doesn't have to be perfect. And so these savings become the gap between $2 a doc to review 10% versus $2 a doc to review the other 2 million. And it's very powerful. And you stop when you run out of relevant documents. In other words, the algorithm will find a high percentage of them. After that, it's going to break down like anything. But the courts have accepted that the cost to move beyond that curve to find the few remaining relevant documents is not justified. And you don't have to do it. And they've approved it everywhere. So one quick example, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, our client was a bank. They had collected 2.1 million documents that needed to be produced or reviewed to see what was relevant. Frankly, despite their best efforts, only one in 100 were actually relevant. They found that out by sampling. And so they said, we're going to pay a fortune to review a lot of wasted documents. So it was years ago, we said, well, let's try this CAL system, our continuous active learning, where you just have the team and you just start feeding them these documents. They'd done an earlier production, so we had a bunch of what we call seeds to, to get the ranking started. Suddenly, instead of 1 in 100, they were seeing 20 in 100, and 25, and even 35. And that means your review is going so much faster. Uh, and then they stop when they weren't seeing relevant documents. So this is the same kind of curve I showed you, but this is one for our review. And what we found is the team found 98% of the relevant documents when they stopped. How did they know that? They did a big sample of what they hadn't looked at, like 6,000 doc sample found two relevant in the 6,000. It meant they'd found 98%. They'd reviewed less than 10%. And that's 100,000 instead of 2 million. And I can summarize the law by quoting Judge Peck. He's right here. And he's said the laws developed. There have been dozens of cases approving this to where it's black letter law. If you want to use it, you can, and you save a fortune. So in two minutes or less, <coughs> I'm just going to hit the problems. Because there's lots to think about. We could do a whole hour on it. One is, kind of interestingly, algorithm bias. And this is one that hit uh, Jeff Bezos, where they had come up with algorithms to help with hiring. They do a lot of it. And they found out that it liked men rather than women. And uh, maybe it's correct, but it, maybe it's possible that the things were developed by men or, I mean, by people who weren't trying to bias it. It's an innocent thing. But we've got to be aware that these algorithms that seem to give us the right answers might not be giving us the right answers. And plain and simple, we have to worry about it. Secondly, there's ethics in AI. You know, the self-driving cars are interesting. The car's driving along, you're sitting back, and suddenly there are a, a, a bunch of school kids out on the road. And the choice is, of course, to run over the school kids and probably kill some of them, or to divert right into a cement wall where you're likely to be the victim and might die. What should the system do in that case? Well, we all know. Uh, it's much worse to run over the school kids than to sacrifice myself to die. So that all makes sense until I become the car buyer. And if I'm buying a car and I know that's the algorithm, I might think about it myself. So there are ethics issues we have to concern ourselves with. And there are problems where algorithms magnify problems, such as when the stock market runs amok. So ultimately, the big problem is the one you're going to have to face. What holds back development of algorithms and AI and new methods to practice law is ourselves and the billable hour. And as long as we're charging by the hour to deliver our services, we are not going to be excited about developing means and paying money to do so that will cut our billables. It's like when I tried to create a card system in my law firm when I was first starting for memos so we could reuse memos. And I was amazed that I just didn't get the buy-in that's because we were charging to rebuild those memos every time. So I couldn't be more excited about this topic. I wish I could be sitting there with you and have another go, because I'd be out there developing these kind of systems. But I hope I gave at least a little taste of what the possibilities are in the law. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, so in the uh, towel in the evening with the moon going over, I wanted to John Fredenick, 
We discovered this thing with Speaker, fall semester 2018, Lebanon College of Law, University of Florida. Thank you very much.